hey, today I'm updating my July net worth to see whether am I on track to reach my goals. Previously in June, I've updated that my stretch goal for this year is to arrive at 500,000 with my net worth. And minimally, I want to arrive at 450,000 for the end of this year. If you're new here, my name is Ying Ying and now I realize this is started out by Jingles and I. And on this channel, we explore the realization about life and happiness as we pursue our goals. My net worth includes liquid assets such as cash savings, stocks, robot advisors, cryptocurrency, and funds managed by my financial agent. Retirement funds under the Singapore CPF system, which is a savings and pension plan for Singaporeans and permanent residents. And lastly, my property. So in this video, I'm going to share the breakdown of my net worth comparing June and July 2021 and share our realization about the recent Chinese crackdown which has impacted my portfolio. As such, July 2021 hasn't been a good month compared to June. Before I start, as a disclaimer, I am not a financial professional advisor. This video is just for educational purposes and I'm merely stating my own point of view and journey. So do not follow what I do and always remember to conduct your own research and studies. Make smart decisions and if necessary, seek a licensed financial professional advisor to make the best decision that suits your own needs. For my liquid assets, I have cash. It is lesser for this month because we use some of our cash to pay for our wedding in July. We are working on sharing more about our wedding process as well as our budget and whatnot. So let us know if you have any questions. We would love to incorporate them in our upcoming video. I have three types of stocks account. One, which is Singapore OCBC Securities, holds most of my Singapore stocks. And two, brokerages that hold most of my overseas stocks. And that is Interactive Brokers as well as Momo. So for the Singapore stocks, it did pretty well month on month um, while I'm down on my overseas stock holdings. And that is mainly due to the crackdown of Chinese tech stocks. The next one is IFAS managed by my financial agent. So it is also down as well from 37,395 to 36,630 for July. So the next one is Stash Away. I have three portfolio uh, income account which is dominated in Singapore currency and it invests in Singapore-based equities, uh, REITs as well as bonds. This portfolio has done well since Singapore equities have done pretty well and if you want to get started on this portfolio, you will need a minimum of $10,000 due to the nature of the security lot sizes. Okay, the next stash away portfolio that I have is the core portfolio which invests in global equities. This one has not been doing particularly well also because of China Tech which stash away has continued to maintain or increase the exposure with their recent re-optimization. Lastly, I have about $2,000 in Stash Away Simple, which earns a slightly better interest compared to the bank. On my last video, I shared that I am looking into other robo-advisors, so I wanted to update that I am still looking and I have not really started going in-depth into which one that I want to start with and it's also because I'm busy and lazy. <laughs> The next one is cryptocurrency, did slightly better in July and overall the cryptocurrency that I have in my Coinbase, Block5, Btrex and Poppies account uh, is worth this much right now. Uh, I do think that cryptocurrency as a technology is the future, it's just a matter of how we can harness that technology. For now, we just need to deal with the many parts and volatility. So the next part would be my less liquid accounts, which is my retirement account under the CPF system in Singapore, which is a four savings that we have to put aside every month and that would only be realized if we reach 55 years old and hit the minimum retirement sum. Otherwise, we will need to wait till we are 65 years old, provided that the laws don't change. I have transferred most of my OA, ordinary account, to my special account. SA to take advantage of the slightly higher interest. The reason why I do this is also addressed in my previous video. Lastly, it is property. This is my Malaysia property that I could only see from afar being rented out and putting the property in the market to see whether are there any interested buyers. So here is my total update for July, which I'm down about $25,000 from June. It is not a rosy month at all and the main reason is because I'm down on my China stocks compared to what happened in June. I'm invested in the China 
tech sector as well as the ad tech sector as being beaten down due to the regulatory risk. And at this stage, I'm prepared that at least for my ad tech stocks, it will become zero. So what are my thoughts about the Chinese stocks situation and would I continue to invest in them? I've been reading a lot, watching Adam School, Analysis, Chicken Genius, as well as asking Prof G, Scott Galloway, on his take on the China regulatory risk and crackdown. And these are my rough thoughts so far. I cannot claim that I'm an expert in the China tech. While I used to live in China about like 10 over years ago, I'm not living in China right now to know much. And probably I would make money if I knew earlier. Because I'm not, I'm going to include the links and the readings as well as the writings that led to my thoughts today. Feel free to add on to our learnings, our realization by starting a conversation in the comment section below. First of all, the Chinese crackdown would probably still take a while and it's better to wait and see and let the bullets fly for a while. So there's a need to rebalance the power between the government, the tech players as well as consumers. Many tech platforms are becoming the de facto institutions where they pose a significant challenges to a nation state's legitimacy. Many tech companies are crucial to our everyday lives and they set the rules of the game in which society operates. For example, Facebook sets the content moderation policies for more than one third of the world. They are deciding what's right and what's wrong. And because they are powerful companies, the key goal for them as a corporation is to earn more money for their investors. And sometimes it comes at an expense of consumers. So one example would be the ad tech sector in China where parents wanting their kids to have a head start or kickstart in life and compete with their peers, send their kids to additional tutoring classes and this has led to many ad tech companies popping up in China. Technology has enabled teachers to be able to teach a large cohort at a time and they were able to scale very very quickly. Funded with so much cash and investment, the ad tech companies have started a war with each other to compete to see who can enroll more students. Uh, it reached a point of uh, market saturation. So instead of focusing more on innovation and improving the education, they have spent money on advertising and sales. So I didn't know the situation was so out of hand until I chanced upon this Douyin video. That summarizes the situation pretty well. 疫情带来线上流量的爆发，粮食充足的教育机构们快速的扩张，招揽几万名辅导老师，一边辅导一边销售，在线的战火也蔓延到整个教培行业。什么，你的购物车里有孩子的未来吗？你不来补课，我们就
<laughs> and it is the strategy to reorient China's economy by prioritizing domestic consumption while remaining open to international and trade investment. And then the next main area would be environmental and climate change. Lastly, improve the urban-rural inequalities as well as the demographic trends. By improving the lives of the people in the rural areas, this is what the government is also looking at. And I have seen this in this lovely video filmed by a Japanese director called Take Uchi-san, who ventured deep into the poorest place in China where you can see what is being done in this area. So using this playbook as a guide, we can see how companies would slowly be moving towards achieving the goals that the Chinese government has set out. My next point would be that China has moved towards the view that hard tech are more valuable than products that take us more deeply into the digital world. President Xi declared that while digitization is important, we must recognize that the fundamental importance of a real economy and never de-industrialize. So we'll likely see the Chinese government rein in the activities of consumer internet companies. With the diminishing growth in the overall Chinese internet users and most of the big markets have already digitalized, tech giants have to focus on increasing spend from the existing users to grow. Companies that focus on the revenue at the expense of consumers' welfare and societal benefits that are net negative to both mass consumers and the government would be affected. Unfortunately, the business model for many of the tech giants are broken, like how journalism and media is broken. Traditionally, they are rewarded by accuracy. What is important at the moment is about eyeballs, click and retention. Such fun productivity distractions and how video games are being forced to make edits. What are you doing? MLBB. MLBB? Yeah. Just like how I thought the China ad tech crackdown would not be as serious as I thought, things might change drastically. So I wouldn't be surprised that big tech companies like Tencent and Alibaba would also face further scrutiny from the government. The focus on technology in the five-year plan is on hard tech, not e-commerce or entertainment. So invest with caution and start understanding China's playbook, i.e. the five-year plan, and be prepared that you are going to be on a roller coaster ride. So if you have stayed to the end, we would like to thank you for your support as well as the comments on our previous videos. We have learned a lot through your comments and discussion as well as questions. We are still very new with all aspects of life, financial topics as well. So we are happy that you can be part of our realization journey. So till then, we'll see you next time.